Hi, um, I'm Benny Gill, Director of uh, Engineering at Nutanix. And um, as Greg mentioned, um, a couple of years ago, Nutanix talked about converged architectures. And uh, today, uh, many consider us uh, a leader in that space. Today, I want to talk about a new phrase that's been talked about, software-defined data centers. Um, what are the technical cornerstones for software-defined data center? and talk about Nutanix in the context of software-defined data centers. I'm not trying to define the term, because uh, uh, maybe software needs to define it. All I'll do is uh, look at Nutanix in that context and see what are the ingredients for software-defined data centers two years from now that will make it successful versus not as successful. So here are five major key differentiators for a successful software-defined data center versus a complex, non-successful software-defined data centers. First thing, and the very most important thing, is simplicity. The next thing is scale out. We've been talking about that. Um, we also need a lot of flexibility in software-defined data centers, so all sizes, workloads, hypervisors. Then we need true convergence, and I'll talk about what I mean by true convergence. And finally, end-to-end -end visibility. You know, it's very important to understand your data center end-to-end. -end. Let's talk about simplicity. Now, simplicity is not just about uncluttering a PowerPoint slide here. It's actually not even about uncluttering our administrative UI. It's really about uncluttering the mind of the admin, the mind of the user. And it's about uncluttering from various concepts that they have learned to understand and master. You know, from concepts of NFS, iSCSI, uh, uh, SIFS, SMB, from concepts of fiber channel, arbitrated loop, zoning, LUNs, shared nothing, active, 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 passive, link aggregation, battery backup, port assignment. You know, unclutter the admin's <coughs> mind from all these features that Individually are solutions to some problem, but an, as an aggregate, they become the problem. So what we want to do is make sure that the admin can focus on the most important thing, which is the virtual machine. So what does it take to make software-defined data centers simple? First thing is you bring in simplicity by design. And on top of that, you build features that further simplify. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, again, I'm bringing Nutanix in, into the context of software-defined data centers. Um, we have various features, a smattering of them here, like self-discovery using Bonjour. So what that means is in a, uh, in a data center, you bring in new Nutanix nodes through implementation of the zero-conf protocol the uh, Nutanix nodes will be automatically discovered. They'll pop up in the UI, and uh, through a couple of clicks, you can add them to your cluster. We have auto-deployment of data stores. So once you create a container in Nutanix, it's automatically made visible on your VMware hosts. So you, we, we save you that extra step. We believe in management by exception, because scale is in our DNA. And what that means is we don't want to show you a barrage of information for all that you're managing. Instead, we want to show you what you need to look at. So we manage by exception. And Steve will be uh, showing you a glimpse of our new UI where we follow some of those principles. We have the notion of auto-pathing that makes uh, failover simple. I'll go into a couple of slides uh, on that as well. And then finally, we're introducing a REST API for automation. So for any uh, simplifying feature that we have not implemented yet, we allow you the ability to use a REST API and automate your life in the data center. So let's look at an example of how we simplify. This is a typical uh, mesh topology for high availability. On the left side, you have vSphere hosts. And on the right side, you have um, IP addresses where your data stores uh, can be accessed from. Now, if you want to handle failure of either the, any one of the left side entities or any one of the uh, right side entities, you have to have configured data stores on each vSphere host um, uh, pointing to all the IP addresses. 
as well as you have to mount all the data stores as well. Now this is a complex topology. Now you can build features on top of it to make it automated, simple, say you can create a feature where you integrate with the DNS server in your data center and make it farm out the IP addresses, configure them when you add remove nodes. But the Nutanix approach is simple. And again, by design. So we don't have a mesh topology. What we have is usually the VMs are routing to a local controller VM. And if the controller VM dies, the routes are changed. And we go through an external switch to, the, um, to another controller VM in the cluster that's not as heavily loaded. And when the controller VM comes back, the route is restored uh, back again. There is no notion of hard coding IP addresses and, and multiple of them uh, in, in our architecture. Another example of how we simplify the life of the admin is uh, REST API. Now on our product, we're going to have a live REST API explorer. Uh, it's arguably the first in our industry. And that gives the admin the ability to learn our product, learn the REST API, play with it dynamically. Steve is going to show you a demo on that. So, so a question on the, the API. Is that in there today, or is this coming? Is it, it's coming. OK, so it's yeah. not there now. Yeah. We're going to show you a demo. It's a preview of what's coming. <clears throat> now, the next thing I want to talk about, again, everybody knows is extremely important, is scale out. Now, virtualization is bringing in consolidation, and consolidation is happening at massive scale. Now, if you want to manage massive scale, what you need is the removal of silos, because the more silos you have, the more complex the administrator's day-to-day -day job is. So the most important thing is to make the management silo-less, and that only comes through scale. Now, compute is scalable because it's not shared. You can have a 1,000 clusters and run them. A compute is no problem. The last frontier for making scalability happen in software-defined data center is shared storage. And that is the most hardest part. And um, in my technical slides, um, maybe uh, in, into the next section, I'll show you why it is very hard and why Nutanix is the only solution out there that truly solves that problem. Just to give some examples, um, how we linearly scale, uh, on the x-axis, we have number of Nutanix nodes. And on the y-axis, number of VDI desktops. And as you see, we can linearly scale. We add more Nutanix nodes. You can add more desktops. But at the same time, what's also important is how, you, how your performance is uh, scaling as well. So, you, so we keep the response times flat as the number of desktops is increasing. So now. So your linear scale thing is on running VDI. Yeah. And well, yeah, OK. So your linear scale there is number of VMs. Yes. That's easy, because I can spin up lots of VMs. But, you're saying, but we're now we're looking at what are they doing, and we're talking about VDI. Do you have any information on how you would scale with different workloads? Because enterprises are not going to have Yes, yes, of course. So this is just things. an example. I'll show you the architecture why we are suited for all sorts of workloads and why we'll scale similarly for all sorts of workloads. Right. Um, the other uh, piece about software-defined data center is the notion of true convergence. Now, a couple of years back when Nutanix introduced the notion of converged architectures, there was no confusion here. Um, since then, people have created their own versions of convergence you know, that I like to call duct tape convergence. So we have to throw in this um, slide in here to explain what we mean by true convergence and why it's important to have the right kind of convergence in your data center. So the first question to ask yourself is, are you wasting compute resources? And what that means is, when your storage is idle, can your applications use the CPU that was earlier meant for the storage controller? And when your applications <coughs> are idle, can your storage controller now do some background processing like intelligent lifecycle management, compression, disk scrubbing, and all that? If the answer is no, then you don't have true convergence. Other question is, are you using up too many networks, uh, network ports in your data center? So have you consolidated your server and your storage network interfaces. 
And did you eliminate a storage fabric that you used to have in your data center? Again, if the answer is no, then you don't have a true convergence. The other question is, where's your I.O. going? Is the I.O. going over multiple hops? Or is, it, uh, is the I.O. getting blended uh, because of non-VM awareness and the multiple hops that you have multipathing into some random group that the storage controller has to handle? And finally, is your storage on virtual hardware? So what that means is, how easy is it for you to add more CPU, add more memory to your storage controller? If it is virtual, it's going to be easy. So here's a screenshot of what I would call not converged. Uh, computer on one side, storage on the other side. Even if it's in the same rack, doesn't matter. Uh, some compute wasted on either side. Networking is duplicated. And here's what I would call converged. You have VMs and the controller uh, virtual machine, the storage controller on the same host, sharing resources. You know, on one side, storage controller is using more CPU and memory. The VMs are using less. On the other side, it's the reverse. And the network is uh, common and shared. That, that gives you simplicity. Now, there's a side effect of all the simplicity is that it gives you better reliability, better availability, and better serviceability. And I'll go into some aspects of this uh, further down. So software-defined data centers also need to have a lot of flexibility in terms of what size you start from. I mean, every admin wants to define uh, a nice data center where they are starting off small and then pay as they grow. So silo-less growth is extremely important. And um, we provide that uh, in our platform. The other thing that's very important. Sure. Like sales for the last hour? Yeah. Maybe we can get to some technology? Sure. Point. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm very close to, I yeah. Think we understand a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Most of us have heard of the <laughs> Yeah. So what I'll do is um, talk about what we are uh, announcing um, later this year. Uh, we are going to support all hypervisors, KVM. We already support VMware. We're also going to talk about Hyper-V. And also notion of, uh, There's one missing up there, though. If you're supporting all hypervisors, shouldn't Zen Server be in there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's on the roadmap. Um, okay, so yeah. so many snarky comments are going through my head right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> it, it, it might be on their roadmap, but it's on Citrus's sit, so, roadmap. Yeah. Well, so, the, so this oh, is. Um, the difference between mm -hmm. several and all. Okay, so here's. Well, you want to be pedantic. Yeah. Uh, they're yeah. all represented, just sized on, on market share. <laughs> Yeah. So you can't see some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this slide was about what will make a software-defined data center successful, and that would be Terms. all hypervisors. And uh, we are trying to bring Nutanix into the context of that. I mean, not necessarily saying that Nutanix implements all of the features required to make a software-defined data center. KVM is available now, though. Yeah. And can you change hypervisor? Exactly. I mean. The answer is we're working on that. It's not yet available. Okay. Uh, so hypervisor mobility and clusters. The final thing is end-to-end -end, uh, visibility. Very important uh, for the admin not to be uh, playing a game of hot potatoes. What we provide with Nutanix support is deep integration. Make sure that we can support and answer all your questions on all three fronts. Um, the other is uh, we like to remove any guesswork from here. You know, deep analytics, Steve will show you an example of that. Here are some uh, uh, concept slides uh, for a new GUI and show how we'll be providing better analytics for you. I think a live demo would be more interesting. Let's talk about uh, the Nutanix uh, file system at this point. Any questions? At this time, I would have uh, liked to run the video, uh, if you can help me. Let's hope this sound is going to work. Got your, your Bluetooth beatbox there? Yo. <laughs> got, my, got my speaker. <laughs> Good work. And it might be very loud. Or it might not be loud at all. <laughs> Over 95. Also, a side comment here. It looks like we have a light shining directly on the projector screen. Oh. Yeah. Which is really big. Alyssa, to see if we can get that turned off. Okay. We'll, we'll try to get that off. Thank you. Try to move the handle. Sorry? 
would be bad. Yeah, yeah. For this. yeah it's just there. Yeah. It's not my word. It's not my word. Just don't burn your hands. Look at that. Just, uh, no. Nope. 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 Stay as prime terrible as you can. Yeah. I'm just going to make sure the audio is working. Yeah, but there's a computerized light switch. Yeah, there we go. The audio is working. You guys can't figure out about computers? No. <laughs> is there an app? We're not AV geeks. Well, not anymore. virtual machines to run on a single physical host and mediate all I.O. operations, including read and write requests. A centralized storage array, such as a SAN or NAS, is typically used to provide shared storage for all of the VMs. Nutanix takes a different, much simpler approach. Its converged architecture incorporates local direct attached storage for faster performance and greater flexibility. Each node in a Nutanix cluster includes flash-based storage to deliver massive IOPS for high performance, as well as hard disk drives for low-cost, high-capacity storage. Adhering to the principles of a software-defined solution, Nutanix implements all control logic as a software-based service. A virtual storage controller runs on each node in the cluster, improving scalability and resilience while preventing performance bottlenecks. With storage and control logic now local to the guest VMs, there's no more need for expensive centralized storage or dedicated storage networks. The Nutanix distributed file system aggregates local storage across all nodes, creating a single storage pool that can be partitioned into one or more data stores. These data stores are then presented to the hypervisor using the standard NFS protocol to provide storage for all hosted VMs. Because the hypervisor communicates to the Nutanix software exactly as it would a traditional storage array, there is zero change to the virtual environment. VMs are provisioned and managed as before, but without having to configure LUNs, volumes, or RAID groups. Now let's look at how Nutanix manages a typical write operation. When a guest VM needs to write data, its request is passed to the Nutanix controller, which then executes the write to local flash storage. It's also important to fully protect data so that it is always available, even if a node fails. To ensure the strongest protection, data is replicated synchronously across multiple nodes. For a typical read operation, requests are served by local storage resources. Keeping data local to the VM provides the fastest possible performance. That means for the majority of read requests, data never traverses the network. With many enterprise workloads, the older the data, the less frequently it is requested. When data becomes cold over time, it is migrated from flash memory to more economical hard disk storage. However, if that cold data at any point becomes hot again, meaning it is requested more frequently by a VM, Nutanix automatically promotes the data back into flash for the fastest possible performance. What happens if there is a node failure? Nutanix supports standard high availability capabilities, such as VMware's HA, so a VM will automatically start on another node. If that VM then needs to read or write data, it sends its request to the local Nutanix controller. If the data being read is not local, the controller determines where replica data has been placed and forwards the request to the correct Nutanix controller. The data is then sent back to the local Nutanix controller over a standard Ethernet network. The local Nutanix controller passes the data to the VM through the hypervisor and stores it locally for future access. At the same time, the Nutanix software once again replicates the data throughout the cluster in order to return the full cluster system to a fault-tolerant state. Each Nutanix node runs independently and leverages the Nutanix distributed software architecture to create a completely unified cluster. Yeah. Um, I think um, th that gives us a brief introduction of um, how the Nutanix uh, cluster works. Let me reintroduce myself for the next section. Um,
Bonjour. Hi, I'm uh, Benny Gill, uh, Director of uh, Engineering at Nutanix. Uh, I'd like to go into a, a more detail on the Nutanix distributed file system um, and why we think it's the file system for the software-defined data center. A um, few things about legacy file systems that we need to understand uh, to see how Nutanix file system differentiates from legacy file systems. The first thing is legacy file systems suffer from no VMware, uh, VM awareness. And what that means is now you have silos that you have to manage instead of VMs. And that creates f limited flexibility and quality of service that you can give to your individual VMs. There's also IO blending uh, that happens because the storage controller is not aware of which IO is coming from which virtual machine. And the IOs get mixed up. And that limits performance that you can get. There's a curse of. Uh, fine-grained locks. Now, if you look at traditional file systems, um, because they are sitting multiple hops away from the servers, they do not know what address on the uh, address space of, of the storage will be addressed from which virtual machine. So essentially, what's happening is the I.O. that's coming for a particular, say, a megabyte on hard disk it could come from any interface and from any node. If you have an NVA cluster, it could come from anywhere. To implement that efficiently, what traditional file systems do is that they implement fine-grained locks. Now, fine-grained locks are good if this I.O. blending is happening, but there's a problem with fine-grained locks, and that is it limits your scalability. You can do it good up to you know, 16 nodes, 32 nodes, but beyond that, it becomes a scalability bottleneck as the number of locks flying around in your file system increases to the millions and, and, and the billions. Hey, hey we, we can take a, a moment here. I know that uh, I think there's a lot of questions regarding maybe deeper technical questions about how, how we do the things that we're claiming that we do. So why don't we, just, why don't we stop and, and make sure people have an opportunity to ask questions because okay. I, I fear that we're not, we're not addressing some of the questions on the slides. So let's open it up a bit to keep this more interactive. So who wants to start off and, and, and start asking the hard questions? Yep. Let's do that. OK, I'll jump in. Why not? Yes, we definitely need to get into some more technical stuff. I um, understand that you guys were asked to give some explanation and background, and that, that's cool. Um, I think we've done enough of that now. Yes. Certainly, the, the audience on Twitter is, is kind of losing patience a bit. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we need to. We need to talk about how your gear actually does the scale-out stuff. So what is the, the design that you're using? One thing that I'm particularly interested in, there's a lot of talk about VMs. That A lot of workloads in organizations aren't all virtualized. Is your gear suitable? Like, Can you run it without having lots of different VMs? Because part of this reminds me a little bit about Teradata. So they have kind of their own okay. VM thing that runs in, inside it, which is a similar-ish architecture. I'm interested in knowing so, the sort of the uh, difference between that. So we are built for that. the virtualized environment. So there has to be a uh, there has to be a hypervisor there. Okay. But you can run any kind of virtual machine that you want there. Okay. So absolutely, you have to have virtual machines yeah. to use this gear. So so if I'm eighty percent virtualized, the storage isn't available to the other twenty percent of the systems. We are not optimized for the non-virtualized environment. It is available, but it's not optimized for that. So, you know, so I, I would rather say, yeah, you, you use it for a virtualized environment. Could you speak to the reason why that virtualization is required for the solution? Exactly. So the point here about uh, the fine-grained locks, I mean, that is key there. And also about uh, being VM aware. So what happens is if you're not virtualized, then the way the I.O. patterns that happen in the data center are actually different. So let me give you an example. If you take the NFS file system and look at what happens to a regular NFS file system in terms of what kind of I.O.s happen. So most of the operations that are happening are metadata operations, creation of file, deletion of file. If you go to the virtualized environment and now you're, that NFS file system is a data store that's mounted, 98% of the I.O.s are reads and writes. And very few are metadata operations. That include 
you know, creation of VMDK files, deletion of that. So the workload is dramatically different. And now what you can do is to solve the traditional scalability problems with the traditional way of implementing file systems in a different way. Because in a virtualized environment, you know that there'll be a small number of large files that are not being created, destroyed as frequently as before. And you optimize for the reads and the writes on large files. So the optimization is different. The same file system will work in a non-virtualized non environment. Uh, but, uh, but that's not what Nutanix uh, intends to do. We want to make sure that we solve your virtualized workloads in the scalable fashion. Thank you. OK, I buy that. Um, and certainly, if I was designing a file system to support VMs, it would be very different than the file system I'd be designing to support user home directories. Correct. Um, but if I had you know, a SQL server or an Oracle server that was physical, mm -hmm. that looks a lot more like a VM than like 500 users accessing their home directories. And if you're saying that you know, the problem with the data center today is that there's the complexity that you need separate storage, you know, why not, you know, when we get to the three or four biggest workloads in the data center, you reach the point where virtualizing them just has no advantage. It's not that it's, you know, it's not that it's all that difficult, but if I have a workload that requires 12 cores, then giving it a 12 core physical machine is easier and less expensive than giving it 12 cores on a so, virtual host because yeah, it's the whole host. I think people might argue with you on that, Howard. Yeah, yeah. I, um, does yeah. anyone, would anyone like to take up that argument? When you use the number 12, absolutely. That's, that's kind of baby. Maybe if you're talking like a 64 core behemoth on a DL980. No, I, but, I could see the argument but there. But if I've got a SQL server that's going to take 95% of a DL380, and DL380s are my virtualization environment, then, you know, what? if I, why do I pay for the vSphere clusters, oh, but for, for the vSphere licenses to put it, to move it from a one, to move it from being the only workload on a physical machine to the only workload on a physical machine? Oh, there's, there's portability, there's DR, there's other considerations. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, well, there are, there's soft, you know, I mean, we, soft the, advantages. That argue, allow allow that, me to that, say, this isn't the right time no. for this conversation, but I would like to have it with you guys. Right, so... <laughs> I'd, be glad, I'd be happy to. <laughs> the thing I want to add in there is, you know, eventually what we want to do with the data centers is make them uniform hardware. Like, you, you're not buying specific hardware for specific workloads, right? So you buy one hardware. Today you're using it for your Oracle database. Tomorrow you want to use it for a big data or workload or some other thing. Make it extremely flexible. So what that means is... Your workloads are cattle. So, yeah, so you got to scale out your workloads rather than scale right. up. Now, there'll be some applications where my you work, do have my these. My workloads are cattle, not pets, but I only have the one prize Brahma bull. Yeah. So well, there'll be some high-end applications just like, you know, you have mainframes. They'll, they'll exist. They'll have 64 cores you want to do, and then that special hardware sitting on the side, that's fine. For the majority of the data center needs, uh, what we want to do is make it flexible, and fluid that you can do whatever workload you want to run. And you'll give up on some performance, you know, give up 5%, 10%. I mean, that's the cost of virtualization. The question is, do you make the management of the data center simple enough that the admin is willing to pay that and maybe buy 10% more uh, hardware to make up for that loss and simplify their life? And, and the bet is that that's going to happen, just to make things simple. And that's, that's an important thing, I think, particularly around the presentation that you're giving, is that this the solution that you've got is not all things to all people. It can't be. So what we what we really need to understand is is what is your thing particularly good for? I know you're kind of doing that, but there's, there's a few sort of marketing statements in there about how amazing your stuff is in general, which like, there's certain use cases that I think we've identified that's like, you know what, this is probably not the solution for that, and that's fine because we don't expect Nutanix to take over all of our compute and storage infrastructure everywhere. But we need to understand 
how does your thing deal with the full ecosystem problem? So not just about performance, not just about having the storage there. It's also about things that you mentioned earlier, like the manageability, REST API, automation, that yes. kind of thing right. that is something that you definitely don't have with other products and that that's actually giving you benefits that are not purely speeds and feeds, right. that are so, really important. Right. So, I mean, we start off solving the, you know, the hardest part of making these data centers scalable, which is the storage, and now we have that. Now the next step is going beyond that and making sure we enter into the space where we can make the manageability of the ecosystem better. I mean, so that's, that's our vision. That's where we want to go uh, step by step. So as you see, we are making progress towards analytics uh, on the cluster, off the cluster. We're making uh, progress on making uh, Nutanix program, program, programmable for the admin. And uh, Steve will show some more uh, things in the demo. I mean, that's where we want to go. Uh, so that it, we are not just making the, uh, solving the storage problem for you, but actually solving the entire stacks problem for you. Even if you look at the way uh, Nutanix support works with our customers, we solve all problems end to end. We take ownership of any problem that happens, and that's giving you uh, a, a preview of what we want to do in the data center. So I can call you if I have a SQL Server issue. Sorry. So I can call you for SQL Server support. I think what he's saying is that they're a single priority strangle for what they're yes. bringing out, whether it's VMware, the hardware, their infrastructure. It's not that whatever you put in your VM is their throat. Right. It's yeah. not the application, but you know all the infrastructure that you have. Uh, so from a, from a hypervisor level, since you guys, uh, you're so mm. tight with the hypervisor, are you able to... Are customers able to upgrade the hypervisor that will? I mean, are you able to keep up with yeah. whatever patches and releases right. VMware right. sends out since you're sitting on top of it so intrinsically? Correct. So although uh, we integrate really deeply with the hypervisor in the sense that we monitor it and you know we also uh, create data stores when needed and all that, but we don't depend on, we are still hypervisor agnostic. 95% of our IP is independent of the hypervisor. So they can upgrade the ESX using WAM and it, that that will work. Uh, it doesn't affect us. It's just that we qualify things uh, in time and advise our customers. Okay, now is the good time to upgrade. And so there's no worries about VMware releasing some sort of feature or some sort no. of change that could no. break the cluster. No, 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 not really. Because if that was the case, you know, it would be hard for us to uh, work on multiple hypervisors. You know, there's very little change that we have to do, and that's the benefit you get of having a controller virtual machine rather than some driver that's sitting you know, very closely tied to the VM kernel. Although currently most of your customers are VMware, right? Yes. Okay. And as an example too, like we ship a 5.0 update one, but I run 5.1 and also have 5.5 in my environment. So you can upgrade. Okay. There are a lot of questions on scale. I know you have a good slide about how we scale on metadata. So yep. About so, three slides. so let's, uh, uh, you know, uh, hunt for some more questions that can come up. I was saying, what are the things that we do? There are some interesting technical um, uh, tidbits here. We've talked about VMware, VDisk level locks. So now since uh, Nutanix is aware of the hypervisor, we know which files. So the way we figure out uh, what files are VDisks, since we own the NFS file system, we can look at the file, the file names, the sizes of the files, and we know what files are virtual disks. And then, we treat them not just as files, we treat them as proper virtual disks in our system and do VDisk level locking. So that reduces the number of locks you have to have in your distributed system and makes it far more scalable than fine-grained locking uh, schemes that regular file systems need to do. Um, the other thing that we do is soft updates. So what soft updates means is uh, if you have to update your metadata and you have to update multiple tables, you just do in a particular order so that you can recover if there's a failure in between. It's, it's dramatically different from doing transaction-based updates for metadata. And the problem with transactions at scale is that it's a very hard problem. You know, the reason why Facebook and Google, everybody went to a NoSQL kind of model is because you can't do transactions at, uh, at, at scale and still have good performance. So, but in, in typical file systems, there is a need for some transactions. Like if you create a file, you have to write the data, and you have to also update the metadata, and in some order. And that's what soft updates means. It's a technical uh, paper that you can read up on 
on Google. There's a problem though. If you, if you don't have transactions, you don't have the ability to roll back or roll forward your, your transaction. So what you need is some process that goes in after the fact, after the failure and can uh, fix and garbage collect the issues that are left behind. And for that, we have a MapReduce framework in our cluster. So the entire cluster, every node has a MapReduce agent. And continuously what's happening is we are doing MapReduce on the metadata. And we are healing all sorts of problems that might have been left behind, any garbage, making sure that we take care of the offline things like disk scrubbing, compression, and all that. It's an extremely powerful concept uh, that helps us scale. And as the size of your cluster grows, the power of MapReduce also grows. And that means if a disk fails, um, the time it takes to heal from the disk failure is smaller as the cluster is larger. And again, there's no limits by design. Every component, every service that we have in Nutanix is written such that its complexity that does not grow with the size of the cluster. So including the UI uh, that you'll see today, uh, a chart that comes on the UI, it comes from a MapReduce framework. We make sure and go through the pains that it will not become slow as the cluster size increases. So MapReduce, the map part is easy because that's where it scales out at cluster, but it's the reduce part where you have to come in with a central control point. So you're talking about that for things like um, distribution of disk, like recovery from disk failures is easier because you have more cluster nodes to replicate to. So kind of that sharding mechanism. Um, what, where is the control point for some of these things? Like, do you have a master controller node? Is that distributed throughout the cluster? How does that actually so work? So map reduce uh, itself is a distributed operation. You do map everywhere, and then yes. you do reduce everywhere. But there's a controller that coordinates all of this. Right? Correct. It doesn't do much work. That controller is elected uh, through uh, our uh, distributed election, uh, leader election scheme that we have implemented. And we use that for almost all services in our system. So if that controller node goes down, somebody else gets elected in, in the next second and starts off where this guy left. Because the metadata, again, is stored in a NoSQL database that's, again, distributed. So there is no uh, notion of this controller node being you know, unavailable or not scalable. Let me talk about metadata uh, and how our metadata scales. I mean, this is the first time we are showing um, detail uh, as to how we implement metadata. And this is the key, what makes us uh, scalable. So take the example, what, what metadata is essentially is a key value pair. You know, uh, this is my uh, offset on this VDisk, and the value is which disk and what offset in the physical disk it's located at. It's basically it, right? Now, how do you do it uh, in a manner that scales? So consider you have uh, you know, a few nodes in the cluster, each node represented by uh, a cylinder here. And each cylinder will store some metadata. Now, if you have a key, you uh, uh, apply a hash function to it. And that's a, that's a c consistent hash function uh, that you apply. And it will point to somewhere on the ring. Now, this ring is somewhat of an address space for the key. So it falls somewhere on the ring. And wherever it falls, you take the next three nodes to be the place where the three copies of the key values uh, pair will be kept. So as you can see, if the hash function is good, the key will be uniformly distributed. And any node is serving a subset of the metadata. This is how uh, NoSQL implementations are done uh, at large uh, data centers like Facebook, uh, Google. It's inherently uh, scale out, and it has been proven. And that's how we uh, do our metadata. There is a notion of self-healing as well. So if any node dies, what's going to happen is uh, we, we remove that node from this ring. And then the, automatically, the ring is going to repair itself. So the keys are going to be distributed among, among the neighbors. And uh, soon, the three copies uh, that had become two will again become three. So now you're ready for yet another failure. And so as the failures happen uh, one after the other, you're sort of healing as well until you run out of space, essentially. Is that, is that tunable, the number of nodes that participate in key sharing? It is tunable, but we haven't qualified and shipped it. We are waiting for a business need for that to happen. We can qualify and tune it. But you know, the software that we have, I mean, that's just uh, configurable. Okay. 
And finally, what's missing in NoSQL implementations out there is strict consistency. Now, if you look at what happened in the big data revolution, like people were running Oracle with acid properties in atomic, uh, consistent, uh, durable isolation. But that did not scale, because transaction-based databases don't scale to 1,000 nodes, 10,000 nodes. It's a very hard problem. So they gave up on consistency, and they came up with eventual consistency. Essentially, what it means is, hey, if D was down, and I wanted to write to C, D, and E, then I'm just going to write to C, E, and probably F. And eventually, when D comes up, it will learn about the updates, and then it will know what the latest value was. So if you go to Facebook and somebody sent you a tweet, uh, you know, if you don't get it in time, it's probably OK if you eventually get it. That doesn't work with file systems. That doesn't work with storage systems, because if somebody wrote data, you better get the latest copy of the data if you read from some other node the next instant. So what we do is we implement distributed Paxos. Now, Paxos is a coherency, uh, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a consensus protocol that's very hard, very mathematical to implement. Uh, you know, less than a dozen companies uh, must have implemented it uh, in, in, in history. But what it gives you is truly scalable, strict consistency in a NoSQL kind of environment. And I'm really proud of the team that implemented uh, Paxos uh, at Nutanix. And uh, essentially, that's what makes us truly scalable. NoSQL married with Paxos. So what Paxos means is, again, there are three nodes. And they might, might not have got an update uh, at the right time. You run Paxos. And Paxos is a consensus protocol and guarantees you that there will be the consensus for the latest data. Then there are a few features uh, that Nutanix file system has. You know, if you have any questions on these, I'm happy to answer. We've talked about fault tolerance. Uh, we talked about how we uh, do network rate. So interesting to note is if you have data on a single disk and we say that we mirror it to some other place, it's not that there's an exact copy of this disk elsewhere. What we do is take the effective data that's there on this disk and give it out to the cluster in a distributed fashion. So when this disk dies, what's going to happen is only the use, u, user's data, not the entire 4 terabytes that the disk has or the 1 terabyte, only the user data is going to be recovered. And that to using the rest of the clusters is no single point from where you have to read and making the rebuild slow. Um, data tiering we talked about. Uh, our software is written in a way that you can support n number of tiers. Currently, we have PCI SSD tier, SATA SSD tier, and uh, SATA HDD tier. But you know, uh, we'll, we'll be soon looking at other tiers, like spillover to an existing San or NAS or the, or the cloud. But the software is all set to handle multiple tiers. Um, we do. Um, information lifecycle management, uh, and we move data between the tiers as they become hot and cold. Again, MapReduce is used for that. So as the cluster size is growing, the capability of MapReduce also grows. And we look at what's hot, what's cold, and up-migrate or down-migrate the data. Um, snapshots, clones, we, uh, we work with VMware Y. We have full VMware integration. We have alerts, anything that goes uh, goes wrong in the hardware that we ship. Again, there's a deep integration with the hardware. That's important for serviceability and reliability. Um, native DR, compression, auto-pathing we talked about. We have rolling upgrades, and there's no downtime. Uh, Steve will show how, how we do add and dynamic add remove of nodes on the cluster. And uh, we've talked about a few other things. Uh, there are many features. Essentially, what we are doing is implementing all the SAN features, all the NAS features that our customers care about. Okay. Any questions we have uh, on this slide? Uh, <laughs> I've got one regarding the uh, serviceability. Uh, yeah. So I lose a drive on one of the nodes. Yeah. Uh, do you guys send out a whole additional node, or do you send me a drive? Just a drive. Just, Just a blank drive. drive. Okay. Yeah. And, and you can hot swap that drive. Okay. And that's also another uh, interesting thing. I have a slide on that, um, where it's not easy to do a hot swap uh, on, in an ESX environment. 
But we have solved the problem and it works. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, uh, that brings me to the end of that section. Um, I can start off on the next section. Uh, let me see how we are doing on time. All right. We have to, we have to make sure we save time for the demos too. Yeah, we save time for the demos. Yeah, so. Okay. so let me reintroduce myself uh, and, and go through the slide. I'm Benny Gill. I'm Director of Engineering for Nutanix. I'll talk a little bit about the reliability, availability, and serviceability, and the DR, uh, disaster recovery features that we have in Nutanix. So first thing, reliability. We have the highest level of data integrity uh, that you can find in the storage industry. Essentially, what we do is we have a version checksum that is stored separate from the data. So when, you, when we return you the data, we make sure that the checksum is correct and also the version of the checksum is correct. Um, the other thing is we do background disk scrubbing. And we have a map reduce uh, scalable architecture for dynamic healing. The file system is active. It's not passive. And therefore, you know, healing large clusters from sector failures or disk failures or node failures <coughs> or block failures uh, scales as the cluster grows. Availability. The fifth and the sixth nine in availability actually comes from a few things. It's a design that eliminates traditional failure points. Uh, essentially, you know, when you go, when you, when you converge compute and storage, into one, you're getting rid of a lot of physical cables, physical switches, and the MTBF for virtual entities is pretty high. That improves availability. Careful choice of hardware. Our hardware team diligently looks at various vendors, especially for SSDs, because it's a new technology. You have to be very sure that you pick the right SSDs with the right life and right cycle endurance. And finally, you have to, to, to get to the sixth nine in availability for storage you have to preempt failures from happening. So you have to intimately know the hardware that you have, like the SSD, we monitor it for temperature, we monitor it for die failures, we monitor it for how much wear out has happened, how much reserve space it has. This deep integration with the new technologies that are out there that are not yet mature, gives you the ability to get to the, uh, the sixth uh, nine in availability. Again, no single point of failure. We have dynamic healing on failure as well. You don't need the notion of hot spares or hot nodes in Nutanix. Just extra space that you have will be consumed because we can distribute the data. There's no notion of siloing uh, uh, available space. And is the SSD smart data ET phone home? ET phone home? Does uh, it report back to you? <laughs> ET phone home. Uh, we do have uh, remote support. Uh, so we, uh, what we call auto support in sense uh, the cluster is going to collect data and, and send data uh, to us with the customer's approval. And the other thing is when there are alerts, the customer can set our support to get alerts as well, apart from the customer. So we have both. Right. Serviceability, again, as we were talking about hot swap, we are the first in the industry to solve that problem with hyperconvergence. ESX essentially freezes if you pick out a drive. Uh, we you know, figured out how to do it. We passed through the whole controller to the uh, controller VM. So you're using VM direct path? Yeah. And, and then we uh, boot ESX from a USB DOM. And then we have auto pathing to help us, uh, you know, make sure that the customer workloads don't get affected while you're upgrading our controller VM as well. Hey, Vinny? Yes. I think we're going to move to the, the demo and make sure we don't run out of time. So yeah, sure. Change the schedule here. So we're going to have Steve go right now, I think. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. I think uh, this is also my last slide in that yeah. section. So this is uh, rolling upgrades. Uh, we have no downtime, so you can upgrade our software to get to the new features. Um, there's no impact on the customer. Any questions uh, before I hand over to Steve? Yeah, how are the uh, uh, controller VMs? Do the, the controller VMs exist within ESX then, or uh, are they? they? Alongside the other VMs. They're just, okay, the, yeah. just a regular VM. Uh, and so how are those upgraded? Do those just upgrade themselves, or you yeah. guys have got a, an no. app that upgrades them, or? No, so, you, no. so you, you'll go to our UI mm -hmm. and uh, download a package, and it gets downloaded into the controller VM. Okay. And from there, we have a distributed system for distributing it. I mean, it's a peer-to-peer -peer distribution in a cluster, again, designed to scale to very large numbers. Mm -hmm. And then we have a rolling upgrade. So one node at a time, it takes its time. So you press a button, and then you check later. I mean, and it just does it? It just does it. Okay. It's black box. Style. It's a black box. Okay. Yeah, you, you don't have to worry about it. Until I do.